Hi, my name is Adam Bean and today I would like to discuss with you why or show you why I consider Java E as very lightweight, effective and productive platform. I'm working as developer consultant um, and I focus on development and sometimes I'm, um, I'm writing books and articles and sometimes it means if I'm on the road or in my dead time and leisure I'm writing articles and books and uh, occasionally I also speak at conferences. I really enjoy, for instance, um, the Java One conference. Um, and um, about three three times a year, I'm uh, I, I'm delivering workshops at um, or organizing workshops at uh, Munich's um, airport. So lots of fun. So we are coding together three days um, Java Six applications and and, and discussing um, best practices and uh, and patterns. Um, What's funny, in recent years, I actually deleted more code than I've written. <laughs> uh, why that? Uh, what I see in my enterprise daily work is uh, there is a lot of exaggerations, indirections, data access objects, data transfer objects, and, um, and no one actually knows why they are there. This is actually the sad, sad part of the story. So there is a lot of plumbing without actually knowing why it's there. And the reasons are, of course, um, there, there are, of course, uh, historical reasons. So um, starting with J2E, J2E required lots of plumbing. And now we have more modern platforms like Java A5 and Java 6, but the plumbing just remained. Um, but what's said, so is that uh, it is, this plumbing is still considered as BA best practice. So on what I try to do is just to, do, to remove all the plumbing and concentrate and on, on focus on business logic. And it's actually not a big deal to write um, overcomplicated and exaggerated um, applications. It is a lot harder to write, um, to write um, business-driven applications with a minimal amount of infrastructure. But um, what's interesting, uh, Java 6 is perfect capable for that. So with Java 6, you can just concentrate on the business logic and, and enhance the business logic uh, or inject the infrastructure later. Um, okay, this is uh, one of the recent books. It uh, talks about rethinking the best practices. And this book talks about a small application I've written for my weblog uh, called X-Ray. And, and uh, this is um, real-time statistics software written with Java 6, Maven 3, and REST services. So what are, in my opinion, the core features of Java 6? The conceptual feature, convention over configuration, in my opinion, is the biggest. What it actually means is you don't have to configure anything. You can just, con uh, you can just um, concentrate on, on, the, uh, on the business logic and uh, just write business code. And Java 6 will provide you with suitable defaults. What suitable means is, for instance, if you are building a GSF application, you don't have to uh, provide faces config XML for page flow. You can just return in an action method um, or you can return an action name in the method. And if the action name matches with a JSF view, um, yeah, this view will be just the um, um, used as the next page without any further configuration. This wasn't possible before Java 6. Or in JPA case, if uh, you have an entity with a persistent entity with attributes and all the attributes are uh, persistent you don't have to configure that what you have to configure is the exception from the rule for instance if you had a transient attribute you would have to declare that as transient and uh, finally dependency injection so what um, um, or uh, uh, sorry um, dependency injection as in cdi case um, what it actually means is if, the, if there is only one possibility, you can just write inject the uh, uh, possibility with at inject without, um, if it is not ambiguous, um, you, will, uh, you, will, um, you, you won't have to, to provide any additional configuration. If it were ambiguous, you, will, you would have to configure that. And finally, EGBs. Um, um, if, you, if you deploy an EGB, it is transactional and monitorable and secure and, and thread safe per default. You don't have to configure anything. So I really enjoy that because before Java 6 and Java 5, um, we had to write a lot of XML and the XML was just um, dump XML because all the information was already in source code and we had to repeat that in, 
um, in XML. So what we used back then was XDocLet. It was a small enhancement of, um, so actually Java doc Doclet, and XDocLet generated all the plumbing for us. So it was obvious back then in J2E 1.4 that the whole XML configuration is actually superfluous if it can be generated. So um, dependency injection was introduced with Java 5. So, but it was very, very simple. So you could just inject at with at EJB, and you could only inject EJBs. Um, it was sufficient for more uh, for most applications, but you couldn't build, for instance, application server based on at EJB dependency injection. This was changed in um, in Java six. So um, in addition to simplistic at EJB dependency injection, um, um, at inject was introduced, and what at inject means is. You can inject external components uh, with um, at inject um, POJOs, and it is extremely powerful model. Actually, it's I think it, there are no more limits. You can inject whatever you want, whenever you want, and there are even pluggable extensions. And um, the CDI dependency injection is also based on um, uh, on conventions, as I already uh, said is. If you have just one dependency, you can just inject it without any configuration. And by the way, the usual com um, uh, configuration of CDI happens in source code with um, annotations and not with XML. Dry, don't repeat yourself, and die, uh, the application is evil, um, is also an interesting concept. What it means, Java 6 allows you to write the metadata in one place. For instance, if you have JPA entity, and you annotate the fields with bin validations, JSR 303, uh, it will be validated twice and prob probably three times in Java 7. So in Java 6, it will be validated for JSF and be also validated for JPA. And in Java 7, you could even reuse that for RESTful web services. And um, keep it simple and stupid. <laughs> it's also a funny, uh, funny concept. By the way, dry and kiss and the Agni, you aren't going to need it, uh, are actually general term, terms and have ne nothing to do with Java, but can be perfectly applied to Java E. Um, so what KISS means is um, with Java 6, you can, you can write actually applications that are lots easier than Java E, so you can keep them very, very, very simple. So, and what becomes more and more important because of movements like DevOps, or continuous deployment is um, the enterprise readiness. What I what I understand um, uh, under this term is, if you deploy a Java 6 application, uh, it will be monitored by the application server per default. So there is no more reasons to um, to provide additional tools, monitoring tools, whatever. You will get at least um, statistics about uh, threading, transactions progress, queue depth, um, errors. Every application server will provide you with these statistics. And this is a huge difference to, um, to web containers. So, um, applications, out of the box applications deployed on web containers like Jetty or Tomcat are nothing else than a blight flight. So, you, you, so what you only will see, usually without any custom code, is the, um, yeah, the behavior of the servlet, which what is basically nothing because the servlet is just um, usually the controller of a view framework and you can configure it um, entirely or, 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 or not at all, and you will only see the statistics for methods to get in the post, which are actually global. So on the enterprise readiness, I also understand uh, somehow um, uh, well-defined deployment. It means in the case of Glassfish, you could uh, deploy your applications with putting your war or ear to a folder or using uh, even REST to upload your application or uh, or the admin console. So enterprise readiness means um, the application servers are usually already well integrated with um, tools uh, delivered by operations and uh, you can easily monitor them and deploy them and scale or, or manage the application servers. So productivity, um, unusual story. What I really like is jcp.org, Java Community Process. Because the whole Java E uh, documentation is free and waits for download, and this is actually what I what I do in my projects. So, um, so what um, what I usually do, I have here a um, I download. I'm uh, sorry, I go to my folder just to show you, and these are all 
JSF specifications, that these are all PDF specifications I'm, um, I'm using in um, our Java 6 uh, specifications. And I don't read, in, read them completely, of course, but they are perfect just to find, um, to find uh, answers for your questions. For instance, if you are interested in a connector implementations, here is it, free implementations about connectors. Um, and if you are interested, for instance, in connection management, you will, you will, um, you will f uh, find uh, the answer inside, inside the, um, the, uh, the PDF. So you see um, everything connection related and um, state diagrams, how, how a GCA connector manages, manages connections. And uh, the same is true, for instance, uh, we talk, already talked about um, persistence JPA. You will find a uh, lots of examples. Um, for instance, here, select statement, JPA, QL, whatever you need, and everything is for free. So what I use in case I'm, um, I need some, some more information, I just s search this, this topic for, uh, search this folder for, uh, for, uh, for terms. And you can download everything from JCP for free. So if you go to jcp.org, jcp.org, and for instance, use 316, is the Java 6 specifications, the number of the Java E, JSR, Java specification request, Java 6, and you can just download from here the PDF file. And, uh, or 317, should be, I think, EJB or JPA or something. Yes, it's persistence, JPA persistence, and 318 should be EJBs. And um, 303 is the bin validation. And um, this is actually unique. Why? Because I'm not aware of any other, other platform which comes so well documented out of the box. And um, what it, uh, this is not only specifications, well, um, readable specifications, it's also Java 6 tutorial which comes for free as PDF. And what you also see here is there are lots of individuals and companies working together um, deep, um, on, on such a JSR, Java specification requests. And why is, why is this good? Um, yes, because um, because of the broad support. Right now, Java 6 is supported by um, about by about 14 different application servers, which is actually a huge success. So all major application servers are already supporting Java 6. And um, why is this good for us as developers? You only have to read to read this specification or to learn it once, and you can and you are able to deploy your application on multiple application servers. This is actually what I enjoy. The truth is de defined in one place in jcp.org, and it is, of course, um, reused by book auto authors, but you don't have to buy books. It's just enough to start to download the specifications. And there is also great Java EE tutorial, also free. So uh, you can download the tutorial um, or browse through the tutorial or download, download the uh, PDF book. So, um, what's, what I also enjoy is the setup. So if you are starting with, uh, let's say, uh, Maven, um, so let's, let's do it. Then um, I just start Maven, archetype generate. There's a wizard and I just have to find a Java 6 project um, type, it is around 380 or something. Uh, it is here. 387 is the number, Web App Java 6. So 387. And group ID is uh, com Java E, or better is, of course, org Java E. Artifact is rocks. Version is okay. Package perfect. Yes. And what it did, it created for me a project with the name Rocks. So now um, I would like just to show you the structure of the projects. And would start a NetBeans, a free IDE, which is extremely capable of um, implementing and developing Java E projects. I would just go to the junk folder. This is what I use for demos. So it's there. And now I can just start it. 
just running it. So this will already work. But more interesting is the single dependency. So if I look at the dependencies, uh, there is only one external dependency required. It's the Java E Web API with the version 6.0. What it means, you only need one single jar to compile all the Java 6 all the Java 6 application, which is actually quite interesting. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, declaring versus implementing is also interesting. Um, it is actually a really interesting uh, topic um, about Java E and complexity in general. Um, what I see in my projects is developers are attempt to start with nothing, with a plain web container, with the excuse it is more simpler than Java 6, and then end up implementing transactions and, uh, and threading with uh, um, overcomplicated thread locals and singleton solutions. In Java 6 case, you would only have to apply a single annotation at transaction attribute, and with this, um, uh, with this uh, annotations, the Java 6 application server will have to uh, will manage the transactions for you. So the question is, would you like rather to implement everything from scratch and at the end of the day you will end up with a simplistic application server or just use um, the application server for that? And in my opinion, the complexity comes not from, from Java E. The complexi complexity comes from the nature of Java E. Uh, everything is so complicated because we have to deal with distribution, cache synchronization, locking, consistency, availability, and all that stuff. And this is complex, not Java E. And of course, it's a lot easier starting with a simple servlet and implementing everything on the go, but you will end up with hard to maintainable application because you will have to maintain the infrastructural code you build plus your domain logic. Um, and um, what's, what I also enjoy in Java 6 is a clear separation between platform and domain code. So there is actually um, no dependency between a business code and Java E code. For instance, if you are, would like to deploy an EGB, you'd only have to, to, um, to apply a single annotation at stateless on the class, and this is enough to have an EGB. There is no need to, um, to in, implement an interface and inherit from an abstract, uh, abstract class. So lightweight, um, what's really funny is uh, in um, actually in several projects, what I, what I, what I see is a f um, funny phenomenon is um, architects um, are, are, are selling an architecture as lightweight and they have uh, Tomcats or Jetties in production. And what turn out, t turns out is that the um, application archive is orders of magnitude bigger than the whole server installation. So it is not uncommon to have 20 max uh, server installations and 500 max um, uh, wars or years which have to be deployed to the servers, um, usually wars in the case of, uh, of web containers. In my case, uh, this is not lightweight. What um, I have no problem deploying bigger servers and then could be even 500 max or even one gigabyte, which is not the case. For instance, Glassfish is around 200 max and JBoss and the others are, are, are comes with similar similar size, um, probably uh, some commercial applications are more heavyweight, but um, the vast majority of open source application servers are extremely, come with extremely small footprint. And what, uh, in my opinion, Lightweight means that you are deploying extremely small wars to a bigger servers. Why? Because I'm really interested in, in short turnaround cycles. Um, a small war can be, um, can be can be zipped and packaged very fast and a, in a bigger war takes longer and, and this is just waste of time. So I'm interested in smaller wars and bigger servers. I have no problem with a bigger server because uh, hard disk is, um, is extremely cheap and, um, and um, even the difference in a, in a RAM footprint between application servers and, 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 and web containers is negligible. So I don't know, uh, Tomcat will start but probably will use about five max RAM and uh, Glassfish or JBoss or Tommy will need about, um, I would say, 20 to, um, to 60 megs of RAM. Um, so small deployables, 
very important in my case fast deployments it should uh, deployment should takes um, take uh, seconds and not minutes or hours and what i really enjoy is you don't need any external dependencies and um, as i um, said in my during my introduction i'm working with java since 1995 and what caused trouble were forgotten external dependencies it is not uncommon to use an external dependency in open source one which is no, not more, no more supported. And this dependency over time becomes harder and harder uh, to manage and you cannot fix them because there is no more, because there is, it, is, it is no more maintained by the, by the community. So what we had to do once is we had to uh, decompile the external dependency, fix the problem, recompile that and document our, this, um, the process so that these external dependencies um, wouldn't be replaced, um, accidentally replaced by an, another Maven deployment. So external dependencies cost some, some amount of, of work. And uh, what you should do for long living projects is, if you really would like to, 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 to rely on external dependencies, just to download the, the whole source code, make it buildable, and in case something something uh, go wrong in the in the future, you can just uh, build your own or maintain your own source tree. Um, yeah, this is the cost of external dependencies. So what I do in my projects um, in Java six projects, I I actually forbid to use any external dependency. And if someone would like to have something, have just to justify that by um, writing just a very short explanation why this external dependency solves a particular problem. Um, if it is and if the reasons are, 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 are hard to explain, it is probably not worth to use that. Um, so also, uh, so try to minimize external dependencies. Usually everything you need is already on the Java 6 server. So um, conceptual scalability, what I mean by that? Um, so you don't need XML um, at start. You probably only need a view annotations. And on a view, I would say you need um, at stateless for transactions. Add inject for inject another layer, add persistence context to inject entity manager, and one add entity to declare a class as persistent, and add, add ID to uh, declare a persistent um, ID. And you can you can build with that any CRUD application you like, create, read, update, delete. There is no bloat. You only need this um, um, dependencies without any additional work. Um, the learning curve is really flat. So actually, what I um, what what I see right now is people are using Java six without knowing um, that is actually Java six. In some projects, developer built um, domain logic without knowing that they actually enhancing EGB or CDI managed beans. Um, so it is a very good idea to start with only a few annotations and, lo and learn on on the go. I wouldn't start with extensive trainings and courses. I would just uh, um, I would just um, think about a small application, so what, what's, what's fun or, or, or halfway usable, and try to implement this application with as less amount of Java six as only possible, and is as um, as um, very very um, as, as as less lines of code as only uh, only possible. So try to concentrate on the business logic and use Java six um, on demand. Um, so um, a few lines of code. Um, say more than 1,000 slides. So this is actually the reason I, why, why, why I would like to show you Java E from the, from the code perspective and would like to start with, uh, with a small application. And um, the question is what we should build. And I would start with um, Java 1 favorites. Um, so it would be a small application with, which cares about your favorite sessions. So Java E web application. And this is actually new in Java 6, so you can deploy whole application as, as wars. There is no need to, in, to introduce years. Wars are faster and simpler. So Java 1 fav, favorites. Enable context and dependency injection um, will generate a very small XML deployment descriptor, a very short one. And uh, it is extremely short because it actually consists of single of, of one tag. But this guys is um, important. Without Beans XML, you won't have at inject uh, dependency injection. So I would just create a project and then try to run it. So Java one favorites. 
run. This will create the war and deploy the application and it's deployed. So um, then I would like to create a JSF page um, because it is the easiest way to start with and usually you would like to have something which, um, which is testable and I usually start either with JSF or with uh, RESTful Web Services. So uh, Java 1 favorites, welcome. So as you see, the JSF is deployed. So what you would need is a, um, so we just, I would try to build a more realistic uh, Java 6 application. So what do I would like to introduce as a backing bean with the name index and the backing bean will care about the state of the JSF page. Package is org dot um, Java one favorites. So, and the, there's a annotation called model. And what model does is it makes the index visible for JSF and this index will be created and destroyed for each request. So this request scope named actually, you can see that this is named on the request scope. The request scope means the man this manage bin only survives one request and named means it is visible to JSF and the default is the simple name of the class. So uh, get greetings and just to show you how it works, Welcome, Duke. And now you should be able to to use this in the page. And as you see, Welcome, Duke works perfectly. So this was the index. So if I click here, I will. You see, this is the the reason why I was able to refer to the backing bin is the name of the class with a first uh, uh, lowercase character. So, and greetings invokes a method get greetings, get greetings. But what I would like to, sh to, um, to create is a class called um, um, technical session, TS. There are actually no esoteric sessions in Java 1, but the official name is technical session with, uh, I think, name, there's a name and ID. And the ID is like TS something. And I will just create a uh, an constructor and also a to string method. Forgot. The string method, yes, both, it's better now. Okay, so what I did, I create a, um, a technical session class with uh, some attributes, getters and setters are needed for data binding. What I would like to do is to populate the data or to bind the data from, from the JSF to the, uh, to the class or move the data from the JSF to the class automatically. And for this purpose, I will have to enhance the index with private technical session. And to show you the lifecycle, I'll create a lifecycle callback on init. And um, with post construct. And I will create technical session here and would like to expose this as a method. Get session. So now you see there's an error and what I would like to do is I would like to create a form. And so two text fields and the first one will bind the um, the session 
and ID. And the other one, the name. This would be the ID and the name. Nah, name. And what we also need is a very simple. I could use some UI containers, but for our purposes, just to show you the capabilities of Java 6 should be just enough. And a command button. And I would like to bind the button to the backing beam. Action. And the action is index add. So I have to create the method. First, um, I'm in the index and in the method add object add. I would like to add that. So um, just probably just give it to system out plus this session. Return null. So saving and just you see ID is TS42 and Duke Rocks would be the your favorite. And what you see is technical session ID TS42 Duke Rocks. So what we have already is we are able to pass um, pre populated uh, domain object between the JSF page and the backing bean. We, we would like, of course, to store the um, the, uh, the technical session to a database. For this reason, the most simplest thing you can you can do is is to create a a uh, session store EJB, and the session store EJB is a stateless session bean, and what we also need is to use JPA. And for this reason, I would create here the entity. And this guy needs to be a primary key. So now you see here we have a problem. And the problem is we don't have any persistence unit. So what persistence unit is? It is very small um, XML deployment descriptor, or small. It's a deployment descriptor which defines in which database this entity is 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 going to, to to be stored. So I will just create it, and you see this is Eclipse link, and sample is the sample database, and uh, drop and create means that the database is recreated or the schema is recreated on each deployment, and the persistence unit doesn't doesn't actually matter because we have only one. If you have only one persistence unit, you, you, then the convention is it can be just injected without actually knowing the name. So now it's created, and in the session store, I'm able to to inject the entity manager with persistence context, and I don't have to specify the name because there is only one, and I need a method save technical session ts um, em merge or persist so what what it means is um, yeah uh, the uh, session is and is it persisted or um oh, sorry is it inserted or updated um, in the database. So this is um, uh, the um, EGB is ready to go and it's stateless means um, we the transaction is getting to be started here and committed at this point. Um, so let's try it again. So what we have ID is TS42 and Duke rocks was the ID and seems to work. So let's look at the database. It 
it was uh, technical sessions, uh, technical session. And there is no Duke. Why not? Because I forgot to inject the EGB to our backing bean. So um, let's do that. Session store. Session store. Add inject. And here I would like to persist. Uh, not session, sorry. Session store. To save the session. So, um, what we did right now, we injected the session store into the method add and uh, into the index, and we can we are able to use the um, the uh, EGB from from a backing bean. And um, so let's retry that. I will just restart with from the beginning. TS twenty one, rocking Duke, rocking Duke, and looks still okay. And as you see, rocking Duke is there. So I'm also able to introduce a new Duke. Tag Duke. And the tag Duke should be here. So as as the whole the whole life cycle from 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 uh, the um, or life cycle the flow of events from JSF to backing bean uh, to EGB three one and JPA seems to work. Um, the most interesting part is here: the persistence context is injected, and by the way, the entity manager is configured in a persistence XML. And the only dependency on Glassfish right now, this is the application server I'm using, is this line of code. What it means is I'm relying on Eclipse link, but I think if I'm deleting that, it would mean just take what is deployed on the application server. You also see here the bins XML, which is basically empty. There's a single tag. And um, yeah, the um, technical session is the entity and it is used by JPA and GSF for data binding and index is the backing bean. So with three components, you are able to build your own um, yeah, CRUD implementations. And um, what you can also do, what is also well integrated is, is bin validations. For instance, I could say uh, the, the name of the session shouldn't be the size should be between two characters and, and let's say 10. So right now, let's try, could say TS size must be between two and 10. As you can see, I can use bin validations from JSR 303 um, and apply them on entity this is what I what I mean meant by dry. Don't repeat yourself. And and this um, this metadata is used for validation twice. Um, the first time in JSF, in JSF and the second time in JPA. If I would somehow manage to hack JSF, I still wouldn't be able to um, to save the technical session in um, in the database. What also interesting here is the annotation at inject. So if, if we look at that, it comes from javax.inject. And um, this annotation here is defined by a specification called um, dependency injection for Java. And it comes, um, this is 3.30. As you can see, is, um, it was defined by Rod Johnson from Spring Source, is the Spring creator. And Bob Lee, at that time, he was at Google and is lead, uh, was lead of the project called Juice and many other companies. And what's interesting with the um, uh, specification, it was actually introduced afterwards. Java 6 was almost ready to go. And Rod Johnson uh, proposed this uh, specification. And what happened then 
is um, Java 6 was was refactored to adapt the specification, this add inject and add named, we saw add named already. So right now we have inside Java 6 the same binary, the same annotations as Spring has in Spring 3 and uh, plus plus, I would say. So it also means is it is actually doesn't make any sense anymore to combine Java 6 and Spring for uh, dependency injection reasons. Um, it is technically possible, but um, it will be in long, longer term harder to maintain because no one, no developer will um, be able to say just looking at the code whether Spring or Java 6 are in charge of the, um, injecting the particular component annotated with at inject. So at inject is the annotation which came from Spring is also core um, core uh, part of Java 6. In Java 6, you can use add inject to inject everything, and just using Spring in Java 6 um, uh, wouldn't make any sense because then you would have uh, two service provider implementations for dependency injection. Um, I'm jump, just just talking about the core dependency injection. Um, this is interesting. What's also interesting is our transactions. So um, transactions are necessary. So I can show you here with just disabling stateless. What happened right now? The session store is no more an EJB, it is a CDI managed bean. And as a CDI managed bean is not able to start transactions. So we would retry our our attempt to store the session, TS and 21. And you see transaction required exception. We are not able to store um, the entity because it um, yeah, we are not um, starting the application. Um, we are not um, in, um, um, accessing the entity manager within a transaction. So it's required, just re-attempting re this. Now it's um, TS and 21. Now it works perfectly again. Um, so, and what's funny, if you look in internet, JPA, JSF, for instance, you will find a lot of tutorials um, this one, for instance, is from Eclipse. And what you see is um, they just show you how to integrate JSF with JPA without EJBs. Uh, usually G EJBs are consider considered to be too complex, <laughs> which is funny. But um, instead of using EJBs, they, they are they're doing the following. They are creating here entity manager factory for each call. And then the developer has to wrap uh, each call, in each interaction with the entity manager with, um, with own transactions. Um, Right here, you see as um, uh, it fetches the transaction, begins, commits. Here is no actually no rollback, which is unfortunate. There should be also a rollback in case the uh, something get, goes wrong here. Um, yeah, um, a little bit problematic, and and just getting rid of EGBs would result right now in Java six with lots of complexity because you will have to to uh, to control the transactions by yourself. Um, yes. This is um, so far our our um, our small applications um, consisting of EGB CDI uh, EGB CDI and 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 backing bean. Um, what do you what do you could um, what you could also also do? For instance, uh, you can declare your methods as asynchronous. For instance, um, let's say this takes a long time, and this is an I/O operation, which can take a bit longer. So we will have to simulate that with um, thread sleep, let's say two seconds. And just we try to, re um, to, to recreate that. So uh, TS22. As you see, it takes about two seconds, or I would say exactly two seconds, to store an entry. So, and to make it asynchronous, you will have to look in the spec for asynchronous, and you will probably find an annotation with the name asynchronous. And this annotation starts, executes the method in a background thread uh, in a transaction. And the background thread um, is uh, managed by the application server, so from usually in a thread pool, and this should solve the problem. So in, um, as you can see, 
Now we don't, we don't have to wait. The operation is performed in background. So a single annotation, no interface, and no interface, there is no interface between, um, introduces um, asynchronous processing in, in Java 6. Uh, what you could also do, let's say we would like to measure the actual performance, so we would like to introduce a, a uh, performance monitor class. It would be an interceptor, and the interceptor would just measure the performance of a method. This throw an exception. Proceed, and I would like to wrap that in try and finally finally block to measure the performance actually. This would be long start. And let's say EC get method. Plus executed in 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 uh, system current milliseconds minus start. So just these are the milliseconds, and we are ready to go. An interceptor. There is an you, you need to implement a single method. The name doesn't matter, but the signature does. So it has to return object. Expect invocation context and throw an exception. And there is one annotation called around invoke. And I would like to use this guy here. Interceptors. And performance monitor. This is the guy. Yes. So 27. And you should be able to see here the performance are two seconds. As you saw, this is an asynchronous operation, takes exactly two seconds, but we can just try it here. For the index class, it could be significantly shorter. shorter. You see, this get session is executed in zero milliseconds, and the um, which is quite fast, and the uh, session store save took um, two seconds and eight um, two and uh, seconds and eight milliseconds. So it is actually okay. What's also interesting in Java six is extremely easy to uh, distribute events. So let's say I would like to notify um, someone per email that a favorite, for instance, uh, was stored in the um, in the uh, in the favorite application. So um, I would create a simple class called favorite listener. And this guy is interested in favorites on, on storing. And there is a new annotation called observes. And this annotation exp um, just um, replaces actually the observer pattern from Java SE. Um, I would like to ex observe the technical session. And this guy say, thanks for notification, plus TS. And yeah, this guy is ready to go. So we, this is a listener. It's somehow like local uh, publish subscribe pattern. So you can just uh, send and receive as many events as you like to. and. Um, What's only considered is the type of the event. The name doesn't matter, and the type is is important. So I would do it in the um, in. Actually, it doesn't matter. We can we could, for instance, do it here right now, or by saving it. So what you can do is you can just inject the event of type technical session uh, listeners, and with simple at inject. So, and what you will see here is, I would like to do it afterwards. Listeners fire session. 
So let, let's retry that. As you can see, thanks for notification was delivered immediately and um, the index get session was still very fast, zero milliseconds of course, and the method add uh, took a bit longer. So, um, so what, you, what you saw right now, it is extremely easy to distribute events um, in Java 6 and this partially will replace JMS for local event, um, uh, for local event delivery. Um, so um, to conclude my um, my uh, presentation, it is actually extremely easy to um, to uh, implement Java six applications. Deployment is extremely fast. Um, all the tools like profiler debuggers are um, are available for you. And um, in my opinion, you should start with Java six first. And in case it's not enough, then look for the alternative because Java 6 is extremely well documented and supported and is also extremely popular. Um, by the way, all events in the recent two years were completely sold out, all Java E related uh, events. Um, on conferences, Java 1 sessions were repeated and, and, and workshops. So it is actually a very good sign. And what I also saw this year, first time ever, is um, that Java 6 um, catches some momentum in startups. So actually, um, young company startups, um, at least here in Europe, are asking me, can you help us? We have some idea we, idea we would like to, 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 to build it with Java E. And yeah, some, some, some companies got our feedback that even it wouldn't be possible without, EGB, without uh, Java 6 to implement such functionality in uh, such a short amount of time. Um, so thank you for um for watching the screen screencast and see you in my weblog twitter or one of my upcoming events and workshops and enjoy java 6 hacking thank you very much